Hi, I'm Scott Wynn. Uh, today I want to discuss using the mortise plane. Uh, this is a rather unusual plane, it's not that common, and despite its name, it's not really used for cutting mortises. It's used for cutting what's called a gain, which is the little relief that you put under the under hardware, strike plates, hinges, and so forth, to flush it out. And also you can use it for putting in patches in uh, restoration. So the difference in this plane is that it has this wide open throat here. And this is for clearing all these chips that we'll be making to cut that gain. It also allows a clear visual um, observation of how the work is going along. So, and uh, unlike a router plane, which we'll talk about in a minute, it has uh, large areas front and back, and this gives good support over the larger mortises. You'll notice that the front of the plane is still on the edge, as is the back on this uh, two and a half inch gain for this hinge. Some people like to use the router plane. Um, it's uh, not my favorite for doing this. My big issue with it is the stability. The handles are placed really far out. If you've got a narrow edge, especially like a three quarter inch door, you've got very little to balance on and control. And it does take some drive against that blade, which is gonna rock that. And you'll notice this open throat, there's two styles of router planes. This is the open throat version uh, and the original Stanley pattern. And Stanley saw that problem, as you can see, of there's no support when using this style of router plane. By supplying this post and this foot, and this provides a new sole, or extra sole, in the front, so it is supported in the front there. Uh, it's still a problem because that is pretty short, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, this short area of sole front and back can drop into the gain as it's being cut and cause mis misregistration. Uh, this is the other version. Uh, Stanley made two versions, but this is uh, Veritas's version. This has the full sole plate all the way around, but kind of the same issue. You've got very little sole plate there which can drop into the gain as you're making it. And so those are, those are two issues I have with using the router plane. All right, so let's cut again and uh, show how this plane can be used. So you can take your hinge, find your location according to what you're uh, doing, your whole project. You want to mark this very closely. You can use a scribe for this, but you have to be aware of the shape of the mark. Uh, you want to when you strike your line, you want to err on the waist side. So that's the length. Now, your position in and out can vary a little bit. Sometimes you want the barrel of the hinge out a little bit. You may have clearance issues uh, on carpentry. You might have trim. Um, but generally, it doesn't go in any further than where the hinge has been cut and that'll provide a full projection of the barrel of the hinge. Otherwise, if you bring it in too far than the barrel, you actually have to cut a recess for the barrel in the edge if you want to bring it in that far. So let's mark our depth of that very carefully there. So let's reinforce these. Now, Keep that right on there. Now, I have a predilection for overcutting my layout lines. Make that snug against the knife. Uh, you want to air a little bit into the, into the waist there, not too much. Okay. If you're concerned about overshooting your lines and having them go outside your barrier. Uh, one thing you can do, and this is particularly handy 
uh, on job site is use the combination square. And you can then set the bar to your depth. And that way you'll know where to stop your cut line. And if you're on the job side, and I'm not going to do this because I really want to do it with a uh, cutting gauge, but you can use the scribe that's in the handle here, and not everybody realizes there's a scribe in there. And you can then use that as a marking gauge and scribe that line. Uh, I'm going to risk overcutting. I kind of like the look of it in a way. So you take your cutting gauge, this is a cutting gauge or a slitting gauge actually, Japanese style. It's used for splitting out um, Komiko, which is the thin lattice work on the shoji doors. Also, uh, this style marking gauge has a cutting edge. You want to use a cutting edge and not a marking gauge that has a pin on it. You want the fibers to be cut because you're going to be working up against those fibers and they can be lifted if they're not cut. So, find your mark, set your knife in that mark. With a Japanese gauge, you can gently tap it one way or another to get a pretty precise setting, really. Looks like we're good. See if I can hit the corners. Not quite. Overcut it. Hit that one exact. So, to cut the gain, reinforce the end cuts, the end marks. Find that knife cut with your chisel. Cut a little bit, do a light V cut, and then do a second one to bring it down to our marked line, which we haven't marked yet. But now's the time to do it. Having set the, you can set the uh, mortise plane. This one sets by tapping the blade to set it deeper and to retract. Almost all hardware, and this is a cheap one, and this actually has a little bit of it, but the, particularly the good brass hardware has a slight RS on it. It's a very slight rounding, comes to the sharp square edge here. What you want to do is set the edge of your plane blade right to where that RS strikes the edge here. That way you get a slight, um, it's a very slight height overall, about the thickness of a finish. If you're setting mortises on a painted surface, you want to actually back the blade off even a little more so that the uh, hinge projects the thickness of uh, three coats of paint. And that way you'll get a nice clean uh, look on your hardware. So once you set the depth, you can use it as a marking gauge and just scratch a line by drawing the plane backwards along the edge. And that'll be your depth. And let's do the other end here. All right. Free up a chip. Let's deepen it a little bit. Now, here's kind of the important thing of this entire process. This is shown to me by a couple uh, different master carpenters over the years, about 10 years apart. Um, the second guy that showed me, I had to uh, pretend I hadn't heard it before. But um, the important thing about this is there's a series of cuts that are made. This cuts all the fibers. Uh, I've seen recommended where after you've made these end cuts, you then just dive straight in with your plane and take out as big a chunk as you can. And that's a pretty much uncontrolled cut. And it's very easy to overshoot that and drive the plane into the end, damage the work. It's very hard to control that kind of cut. Also, if you've got tear out, the, sometimes you've got a beautiful uh, door style, um, but the grain's just crazy. This plane has no way to control that chip. 
um, so you make these stop cuts and the tear out will stop it at each of the cuts instead of running out in big chunks and tearing up the wood. So you want to make these cuts around 16th of an inch apart. All right, so you want to make these cuts about a 16th and an eighth of an inch apart. Uh, the worse, the, the tougher the grain, the closer you want to put them. Try not to cut into your uh, gauge line there on the edge. And then just break those out. Now you start at the far end of the cut. Let's do some gentle and cut right up to our V cut. Right? And just work your way back. You can see how the plane wants to catch, even with these pre cut. Little chips. And they're still good. Okay, so this is often what you're facing this uh, tear out with this plane, even though I made the chips. But you can see that it basically stops at the cut. Uh, if I hadn't made those cuts, I've had it run, you know, just on out and take out a chunk about that, that big. And if you look closely, this edge here is straight. It doesn't show, that tear out doesn't show, so sometimes it does, but the thing about that is, I, uh, this isn't fully fitted yet, so that's not quite going to go in there, the barrel will fit tight in there and obscure some very slight tear out that you may end up with, so for the most part it's not a problem. Uh, if you're con particularly concerned or it's particularly uh, visible or precious piece or difficult piece of wood, I would slow down, make those cuts pretty precise in the depth. I mean, you only get so precise, but once you get a rhythm up, you can feel the weight of the hammer. <coughs> um, and make them very close, at least a sixteenth if not closer. You'll eliminate all but a little bit of this, and none of it will show here. And only the restorer who com comes back in 150 years will realize this was hand cut. <clears throat> and he'll be suitably impressed. So let's finish this off. Let's get our chisel down. Whoops. Make sure those fibers are clean there. Same thing here. Let's free those up. And a lot of times this is not going to be very clean. Come back carefully with your cutting gauge and clean it up. You can see that sliver coming off there. You can take that out. With the plane and the corners are particularly troublesome and that's right where you'll get hung up. So make sure the corners are clean even if you're routing it. Uh, especially if you have to square the corners back off. So, there. so that's the use of a mortise plane to cut the gain on the hardware. As you can see, we get a nice, nice tight fit with the tool. 
I think it's a nice alternative to using a router. You don't have the noise, don't have the dust, and if you don't have to do a lot of them and set up a uh, template, I think it's faster than uh, using the router for just a few.